live from Jake and Joe's in Waltham, this is the Boston College Football Show, presented by Bud Light. For the next hour, we'll have special guests and get you caught up on Eagles football. The Boston College Football Show is presented by Bud Light, Dilly Dilly, and also sponsored by McGovern Chrysler by S. Jeep Ram, driven by you, Bletzer and Bletzer PC, developing long-standing relationships with the clients we serve since 1959. Now it's time to talk BC football. Alongside head coach Steve Adazio, here's the voice of the Eagles, John Pierre-Perel. And happy Monday, everybody. Good evening from Jake and Joe's in Waltham. Great to have you with us on the BC Football Show, as always, on the BC IMG Sports Network. John Mita Perel, my broadcast partner, Pete Cronin. You know him as the old linebacker. And, of course, the coach, Steve Adazio. Congratulations. You are 3-0, and BC 3-0 and for the first time since 2007. Coach, i got to start with this. Great job by Jason Baum and his crack staff. For the first time in 120 seasons of Boston College football, Cronin was there for every one. The Eagles have scored 40 or more points in each of the first three games to start a year. Congratulations. Thanks. That's 120 years, Coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a number right there. And when we, when we did it the last time, it wasn't quite as exciting. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have ESPN, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have No, I know. And if we don't get the 4-0, no one will care. No, I will. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I know. I'm, yeah. Uh, it's, all, it's all in the past, I get it. But Pete and I were watching the game Thursday, and we're saying, man, this team is clicking. This team is clicking on all cylinders, and it starts with the quarterback, Anthony Brown, who's dropping dimes all over the yard. How did he get it done? Well, I mean, Anthony was on the start of this role last year, and it got abruptly uh, halted when he got hurt. And uh, he's picked that back up right now. So I think you're seeing the development of him. And I think he's got a great, bright future. You know, he really hasn't, I mean, clearly, like I said in my press conference, he's really just finishing his, he hasn't played 12 games yet, you know. So um, so I think he's going to do great. His confidence is high. He's thrown the ball well. He, you know, is, he's got an improvement, uh, fast uh, receiving core. Uh, some really good tight ends. We've got, a, you know, obviously a great running back and a, and a really talented offensive line. So there's a lot of weapons around him, and you know he's he's able to, you know, get the ball into the hand of the playmakers. Did you guys go into that game thinking, all right, we can light him up through the air, we can light him up on the ground? How confident were you? I mean, I don't really go into anything saying we can light anybody up, but we felt like we'd be able to have success offensively. Um, when they loaded the box as hard as they did, you know, we just started to go to our play action game and our throw game and. You know, you can't have it both ways, right? I mean, it's hard to load the box and then be sound, um, you know, in, in the passing game. And, uh, it's you know, we finally at the point now where we have guys that can take advantage of that and a quarterback who can take advantage of that. So, you know, so I don't know. You know, people are going to have to make their choice on what they want to do now. They're going to have to. And I'm sure, you know, Purdue will come out and say, well, no matter what we do, we got to stop the running game. So I'm sure that, you know, lead us to throwing the ball and, and trying to you know make some yards um, in, in both areas. I made uh, the observation last week. It looks as though uh, Scott Leffler is uh, taking the onion approach on offense. Each week he peels back another layer. The you know, first couple games it was primarily run inferior opponents didn't get too deep, and then but then when they kind of put pressure on the inside run game, you went to the tight end. So all of a sudden that position emerged. Last week running game tight ends but now the wide receivers are stretching the field you had uh your your did not score a point from inside the red zone last week which is an amazing statistic which means you, you've got you've got, you always look for the explosives all of a sudden not all of a sudden but the explosives are definitely a part of your offense right now so are we going to yeah. see something different each week uh, you know, you might. I mean, I think what we wanted to do is break Anthony back in. We started him out slow, and we didn't want him to feel like he had to carry the team. And then we started out with some, some you know, short throws to the tight ends, and then we started increasing some down the field throws. I think you'll see a collection of all of the above, and and and, and a continuation of that. I thought last week, um, you know, at times we ran the ball really well, but quite frankly, I thought we left a lot of meat on the bone uh, in the run game. And uh, we felt like we could have probably done a little better job in the run game, to be honest with you. But I thought we did a great job in the throw game. And uh, so we're just trying to get it all, all clicked together. But when we're, when we're going, the tight ends are also a very big part of that throw game. And, 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 and so will A.J. be a big part of the throw game out of the backfield. And, um, you know, especially those teams that, you know, 
want to play man and all those other kind of things. So I just think that, you know, for us, what we try to focus on in our offense, tempo offense, is you got to get first downs. Get a couple of first downs and keep the defense on the field, and then you can start dictating to the defense what you want to do. That offense, if you don't get first downs, then, you know, you're like everybody else. You're three and out, and the stress is back on the other side of the ball. We noticed that uh, Wake Forest, remarkable, 105 offensive plays. I mean, just yep. blows your mind, but when you, when you, you, know, when you peel it all back, uh, we were laughing, actually, because Zach Allen was late in the game, and uh, again, Wake was, you know, desperately trying to move the ball down the field, and it looked like he was trying to tap out. <laughs> I think it might have been you. He said, turn around, buddy. You go back in there. <laughs> so I said, I know how that feels. It's not over yet. A few more minutes. Yeah, a few more minutes. You need your best players on the field, and we got to go. And those guys were awesome, you know, because they were getting stressed. I mean, Part of the problem was, you know, we, we traditionally feed off each other. You know, our, our you know, long drives keep the defense off the field, but we were quick striking them a little bit too, you know, so all of a sudden our defense was back on the field quicker. And, and they, that was one of the fastest tempos I've ever seen. And uh, to their credit, you know, uh, they were moving at a fast clip and, 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 and not allowing us to substitute and getting trying to get our guys to get their hand down quick. And, you know, that quarterback, that young kid, Sam, did a great job, I thought. And I thought they had, you know, they, I mean, I think they got a pretty good offensive football team. Um, and, and I think they're going to make some, you know, they'll make some waves, you know. And I know Dave's trying to shore up a little bit of some issues in the back end on defense. Well, you, well, you mentioned going into the game that preparing for that offense is extremely difficult. And yeah. I don't think we had an appreciation for it because it's such a, I, it, it, they run. I don't know what it is, but they go into they go into like a scrum, right. it's a stop and a start, and, and they wait for yeah. the for the someone to make a commitment to a gap, and then the backs are good enough to burst out of the. Well, they start out with an RPO, so they're going to sink the ball in there and wait and see what you do in the coverage, and if you avoid the coverage to kind of fit the run game, they're going to fire the RPO, and it's weird because okay, so it's a real long mesh in there. And then when they make the decision that they're not firing the RPO, then the back just kind of is muddled in there, and then he darts from there. And it's just a weird, quirky deal, and they're good at it. You and must have been listening to the broadcast, because I said they call it yeah. the exact same thing. Yeah, it, uh, it is true. And it's hard to simulate, and it was hard on us. And, you know, and to their credit, I thought, that, you know, the key to that is the quarterback. And, uh, you know, John Wolford. Uh, was there a year ago? I thought he ended up being a heck of a quarterback. And this kid is going to be the real deal, I think. Now, he's got to sustain the hits he's taken. I mean, he took some. I watched a TV copy uh, last night. We took the team for a victory meal. I hadn't seen a TV copy, but towards the end of the game, I guess he was taking some real shots. He was he was against the ropes a little bit. Yep. It's a long season, but that kid is talented, and um, and he'll create a lot of waves in the conference. He's got moxie, and yeah. a lot of players on your team have moxie as well. One guy who's emerged on the scene this year, and I know it's early, but still three three games in, Jeff Smith. Because mm -hmm. I think years past we said, all right, that's a quarterback learning how to play a receiver. Right. Now he looks like a receiver, and he's fluid, and he's confident. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, and he's fast. And, uh, you know, he made some real plays in the game. He had 145 yards, uh, you know, all-purpose yards. And, um so, you know, Jeff's an explosive guy. I think you're going to see him continue to grow through the year. He's only going to gain more confidence and get better. And, uh, and of course, you know, you have the, uh, Kobe White, who's a dynamic guy, and, 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 and then you have Mike Walker, and you have Benny Glines, and, and then uh, the young guys, uh, C.J. Uh, Lewis is in there. So we have some receivers. Um, and then I thought with Tom Sweeney, I mean, he made some real catches out there, you know, really acrobatic catch uh, in the corner of the end zone. So there, there's a lot going on. We just got to, you know, we got to keep, we got to maintain this and, 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 and keep firing, you know, and, and every game is, is, is another opportunity to continue to grow there, you know, so. That was a game was, <clears throat> looking back at it, uh, with, with the exception of a couple of special teams plays that resulted in, in points, that would have been a one side of the fair, but that's how the game is played. That yeah. stuff happens. So yeah. I expect that that's, going to be addressed and you know you, it's kind of funky well, how it all happened yeah it's you know it's addressed the problem is is you, know, you got one of your better guys mike walker dropped a kick and that happens you know every once in a while and, and that happened there was nothing else involved but that and then the snap was a little high but it went through his hands and then we made matters worse by punting it which we have to address and we did and Listen, I mean, you get the ball. If there's an alley to punt, you punt it. If not, let's play defense on the 20. I mean, don't just give them an immediate score. That happened two weeks in a row. But you see, the first week, he got away with that. Right, right. And then that came back to haunt us. So 
we've got to do a, a you know a better job there. But I mean, our special team play overall was really in, improved. I mean, we had some really good kickoff returns. We had great coverage in the kickoff coverage. We had some really good punt coverage. They they popped one punt, but it was because of a hold and it came back. So I thought there was improvement. The only issue that we have is some of our best players, like Connor Strahan and Max Richardson and 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 Will Harris and Lucas. They're all on the special team. So when you tally their total snaps, some of those guys played 125 snaps in a game. That's inhumane, you know? It is. And, but, but, but it also, you know, how do you work the young guys into special teams? Well, we're What's working that process them in. like? We're working them in, but they got to do their job. Yeah. I'm not going to lose a game. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place right now. I would, I would say that that might be something I was, that's disappointed me a little bit. That, Of course, you know, we're missing Elijah. Robinson, he's a mainstay there. We're missing Christian McStrevitt, McStrevitt, and he's a mainstay there. And those are guys that are t can take some of the pressure off of these guys. But right now, you know, the, the sombrero is on them. I mean, and, 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 you know, in a game on defense where we're on the field for 104 or 5 snaps, they didn't need that extra 15, 20 snaps. And even Zach Allen's on the punt team. <laughs> It Which makes, is amazing. Yeah, it really, well, it's it, it's pro, it's manageable. But when you get 105 snaps on offense, it's not manageable it makes, then. It makes it really. Sure well, but, uh, we talk about conditioning, and we we're joking a little bit, um, you know, about uh, about Zach Allen. Um, the, we noticed that Wyatt Ray, in the stretch, looked like he turned it up, turned it up you a know. notch. Well, he doesn't play in any special teams. You know, I mean, Zach probably had another seven or eight snaps on him, and those are coverage snaps. Yep, running down and, the field. Yep. And, and he's a bigger body. Yeah. I mean, he's a 290-pound man. You know, Wyatt's not quite that size. But Wyatt did turn it up, and Wyatt had a heck of a day. I just love the fact that we have two guys that can play like, like that level on the edge. So, like, you know, if they're sliding to protection or chipping Zach, they're leaving Wyatt one-on-one -on -one back there. And they got to make that decision. I mean, you know, because both those guys are dynamic. And they can and they can get after the quarterback, and that's a problem I think for for an offense. It is the defense. When you look at the defense, granted, Wake Forest played a very good game, as you mentioned. What did you look at in the tape and say, all right, this is what we need to do better defensively, especially looking ahead at Purdue? Well, I mean, we're, I can tell you that we're really emphasizing the way we practice. Um, on defense, making sure that you know we are going at a high tempo against them, but it's a, we did that today. But I don't want to do that tomorrow because we're going to be a fatigued football team. But I wanted them to really feel the pedal down on them because you know Purdue can turn the gas up like that. So we're working on that, and I think obviously you know we're working on the amount of times that we're going to have to you know rush the passer and play in the coverage. And and it's a you know I mean Wake you know they threw the ball too, but they hurt us with some big runs you know and and some throws, but I think this is a team that while they want to be balanced, I'm sure everybody does, I, I think that they, they have found their, their their pace here throwing the football. So, you know, we're going to see that thing coming coming down the field lot. One well, guy one guy we love, Pete, Hamp Cheevers, always makes plays. Yeah. Got to be a coach favorite, isn't he? He is. You know, I love him. You know, of course, in that game, I mean, we had a couple plays. One time he went up and just over, he's in position to pick the ball, and it just went it, over his It was a scotch away. Just a little bit, you know, <laughs> and then uh, and we and we lost three picks, you know, that we had in there, which really would have been huge turners right there. So, but I think we're, I think we're ready in the coverage, and I think we're ready to get after the quarterback. That will be the the wild card, I think, this week is like we said uh, the last week. Uh, uh, Missouri was unable to create pressure. Uh, one sack, from what I can gather, I watched some tape on him. Very little pressure. He's back there having a ham sandwich and kind of waiting for his receivers to get open. It, and, uh, it, that's probably the missing piece in Missouri's approach. And the question again is, how do you get pressure on these guys? I mean, you know, obviously you're going to four-man rush them, five-man rush them, six-man rush them. I mean, I think you got to change it up. I think you got to disguise your coverages. I think you got to, and I think you got to give them a, a lot of different looks and just keep coming, you know, and and. Don't let them sit back there and get comfortable in that pocket and start getting on rhythm and in timing because that, that proved to not be a, a good plan. Well, they have two weeks ago, they rushed for over uh, 200, and I think it was 250 yards rushing, and then last week they come and they throw the thing all over the yard. So it's clear they have the capabilities to, to attack you on, on many levels. So yeah. you talk about what you're going to, what they have to do to prepare for your offense. What are you guys thinking about preparing? Maybe you want to come back to that, what, what you're doing to prepare for theirs. 
Well, I mean, I think, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're preparing for a heavy dose of throw. And realizing that I think if he had it his druthers, he'd, he'd like to have more balance. And he said so in his press conference, and I, and I get that. But at the end of the day, if they find themselves behind, that thing's going to go, it's going to go in the air. Yeah. And, and by nature, like you would say that by nature I like to run it a little more, and you'd say by nature I think he might like to throw a little bit more. So where, where that lies will have a lot to do with where the game is going, maybe even the weather a little bit, you know. But, I mean, the week before, I think it was they were playing Eastern Michigan maybe, right? right? Yes. And I think it was raining. Yep. And uh, maybe that had an effect, you know. I don't know that. Um, but what I do know is I watched it Saturday night, and I saw a guy break Drew Brees' passing, single-game passing record, and I said to myself, ah, boy, that can't be good. Yeah, Big Ten player of the week in, in a losing yeah. effort. I think it was a Big Ten record overall. Well, they lost three games by a total of eight points. Right. You know, it was kind of like us in the beginning of last year. There was a lot of close games. And sometimes you get those teams at home backed up against the wall like that. They've lost three games by eight points. I mean, they're going to come out swinging now. Oh, yeah, and they'll have 57,000 there to, to watch it. No it's doubt. a tough place to play. I've played there multiple times when I was at Notre Dame, when I was at Indiana, so I know the place well. It's hard to play there. It's a loud place to play. They're going to have their back against the wall, and they have talent, and I think that he's an outstanding coach. So this will be one tough game. And it's going to be a fun one. BC and Purdue, that's the number 23 Boston College Eagles. We'll come back to talk about that and much more on the BC Football Show. Jake and Joe's and Waltham. Three from the 45 awake to give to Dylan. Bouncing outside with a hole of the 40. 35, 30, Dylan 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Dylan end zone. Is he in? Yes, he is. Touchdown, Boston College. A.J. Dillon is the eagle in the end zone. 45 yards. How do you like that? Live from Jake and Joe's, you're listening to the Boston College Football Show, presented by Bud Light. Once again, here's John Meter like Perel. Another superb night for the sophomore from New London, Connecticut, A.J. Dillon, the bell cow. Since he's become the starter, BC is 8-2. and two. They've averaged 39 points per game, 277 rushing yards, 462 total offense yards per game, and he's rushed for 1,688 by himself. The numbers are staggering. Uh, I know we get caught up in numbers, Coach, but it seems to me that A.J. is clearly the best back in the nation. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think he is. And, you know, in the first two weeks, we played a, he played a half and a quarter. Yeah. So... Um, you know, those are games where he probably could have rolled some real stats up there, but he didn't. And um, now it's when it counts. So, you know, those, he's earning. He, had a, he ran for a tough, you know, uh, tough yardage on Thursday night. And he'll probably run for tough yardage again because they'll be crowding the line of scrimmage. But I think he's about ready to have one of those big pop-out deals too, you know. Uh, yeah, I know he has that goal sheet in his dorm room, and I'm sure there's a couple 300-yard games on there, 250 games. I'd love to see one. God bless him. Let's have it soon. <laughs> Maybe Saturday. Hey, you never know. What about yards after contact? Is there an approximate number there for him? Do we know? Probably. I think Brian White would probably know it. I don't know. I, I told him, I said, it's like people like, it's like, you know, when spitballs stick on you, like people just stick on him, and all of a sudden they accumulate, and next thing you know, he's dragging like, six guys it just looks exhausting to me you know what i mean it does well but you know it's exhausting you'd think it'd be exhausting to him but we've seen it that style of that run style is it just wears people out yeah. over the course of a ball game yeah and what was a, a short tackle two yard gain later in the game becomes a missed tackle and a 25 or 30 yard gain yeah so it's uh you know whatever whatever and then that offensive line i think you gotta it's hats off to those guys too they're you know, that's a veteran group, and, and they look, they really like that they got the hammer in the backfield. They like yeah. throwing, they like blocking for them. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt. You know, you saw early in that, I forgot which play it was, the second play maybe? I don't remember when A.J. went for the touchdown against Wake. You know, we hit a gap scheme, and he hit the thing, and the safety came unblocked and just ricocheted off his legs, and he was gone. You know, and I mean, those are, you know, it's, you know, you want to get him on these DBs and, and, and challenge the DBs to come up and tackle him, you know, because that's hard to do over the course of four quarters. Oh, yeah. yeah and it's a, there's a, that gets back to kind of the, the, the next chapter maybe in the passing game is A.J. Dillon at, you know, at 6'2", 245 pounds, running a sub 4'4", 4, 440. 
with 22 inch thighs in the open field against a 205 pound cornerback. Yeah, we'd really like to see if we get that done. <laughs> I would too. Yeah. Can't wait. It's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I, think it, I think it very well may. It, and it seems like he, as Pete mentioned, he gets stronger and stronger and stronger. But talk about the offensive line in terms of, you, you mentioned last uh, segment, they, they left meat on the bone. What do you do to improve your run blocking? Well, I, I just think that the way they attacked us um, Thursday night, there was some scheme, play scheme that we had in the game plan to get the ball outside a little bit more that we didn't capitalize on. We need to get it there faster. I think, you know, that would have increased his ability, his productivity as well. Um, we get some real different kind of stuff sometimes, and, you know, you got to dissect it quickly and, um, and, 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 and get to it. So, um, you know, I think that's what I'm talking about. In terms of the offensive line, I thought they played pretty strong, pretty powerfully, and, um, but I think we could have helped them. You know, we were, of, we were running some stuff sometimes with these. They were reducing one of the defensive ends down to a five technique, and it was just so packed inside that it was tough when we probably could have got the ball to the perimeter. And when a kid comes in as an offensive line, I'll give you a lot of credit. You, you sat here a couple of years ago, and I, you said, I guarantee you Chris Lindstrom will be a star. And oh, he yeah. is now. Oh, yeah. And he is. You, you, you projected that right away. You're, you're saying the same thing about his brother as well. Yeah. What, what is the formula to be a strong offensive line? Well, I think, first of all, physically, he's an explosive guy. <clears throat> he can run. He's athletic. Um, he's got a defensive mindset. He's, he's got a toughness about him. Um, he's a punisher. And, uh, and he loves it. He just loves football, that kid, you know. And so, you know, he just needed to grow. And he's a late bloomer, and he grew. And his brother's now in the process of he's up to 285, trying to get comfortable in his weight. Like he's, he, Alec runs pretty good, but he looks a little slow right now because he's, I think his body's still not accustomed to the amount of weight he put on. He's put on, uh, you know, like um, I'd say 55 pounds in a pretty short amount of time. You know, and Chris did the same thing. Chris went from 250, 255 to 310. So those guys put that kind of weight on, and, and, and initially I think your body has to get accustomed to it. Well, you talk <clears throat> about being a punisher, and I think, don't think a lot of fans have an appreciation for that style of play of an offensive lineman. I remember when he was recruited, and at the recruiting dinner, we were t looking at all the kids that were coming in and impressed with, with all of what they had done in high school. But the one thing I meant to remember about Chris Lindstrom was finishing blocks. Yeah. 15 yards downfield. Oh, yeah. I just, just getting Velcro on a guy, driving him downfield, no whistle, just body slamming him. And I think, now that's something you're born with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think well, two things. One, I, I'm, as an offensive line coach, I like what I call hip snappers. I mean, they are snapping off the ball and rolling their hips. That's what I look for. I don't like these big, slow guys. I'm not into that, you know. And um, secondly, with him, <laughs> I mean, his father is beautiful, man. I mean, his father played pro football, and his uncle played here at BC, and they're just beautiful. I mean, they. I mean, his father would tell you, he says, listen, uh, you know, I won't even say what he says. <laughs> okay? I mean, you see, he, just, he just likes, wants you to just get after him. You know, you know he probably had it his way, you know, you just, you just beat him up every day and hit, you know, hit him every day you saw him. But, I mean, you know, he just grew up in this rough, rough deal, you know. And uh, you should see Chris on his brother. Oh, my God. It's, it's, un, it's, it's unrelenting. I mean, in his jug every day. It's hilarious. But it's great because that's what you get. You know, like I thought the DBs set a great bar in the DB room for these young guys, you know, all the guys that went on. And, and I think John Baker and Chris Lindstrom are really setting a bar for the offensive line room right now. And that's when you start to really start to roll. And, the, and, and Connor and those guys in the linebacker room. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you get a culture shift. And then there's a certain way that it's going to be. I'm, I mean, I'm guessing that's what happened in New England. I know we're talking about the Patriots now and the pros, but they had a culture. And, 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 and everyone came in and adapted that culture. That's what you're trying to get done. And, and, and that's when I think your team starts to really kind of take off. If you have a good culture, you put good players, there's competition, they hold each other accountable, and then you can start to grow. 
you know. Yep, and it, it, it was evident because we had Saturday off, we had a chance to watch a lot of football, in particular ACC football, and there seems to be a, a power shift in the, in the conference, and uh, a lot of the, those the, uh, sacred cows are no longer sacred, and you know, we witnessed it with Florida State and Syracuse. Uh, so there's, it seems that this is, seems to be setting up kind of as a, as a great opportunity to get on a run and take that momentum and step into the ACC competition here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, that'd be great, you know, but right now, like to me, I just look at it through the eyes of we got to find a way to beat Purdue, you know, because we're going on the road and it's tough to get a road win. And, you know, I'm well aware of what goes on out there in the conference, but in the same breath, I just feel like the margin for error is very small, you know, and we're playing some good teams, right? I mean, we're going on the road to play a Big Ten team for a non-conference game, you know, and uh, we got to bring our A game. It's not like we, you know, we, 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 you know, we give up 14 points again. It can come back and smack us really quickly. So there's so much on, to me, you know, I just like, you know, I, I have to just deal with what's here and now right now because the here and now is absolutely challenging. I mean, to say the least. And, but... Yes, there, there, I think like in any season, there's, there's shifts and there's opportunities. But if you don't take care of the here and now, none of that will matter, you know. And we've got to keep momentum going. And the only way to do that is find a way. We talked about today, find a way to be 1-0. and We've got to focus on this week. We've got to go on the road. We've got to go, take, take a win away from a team who's got their back up against the wall. And, uh, and they're highly capable, highly capable. And... Uh, so it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a serious challenge, you know. And, 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 and our, I think our schedule is very demanding this year. You know? It is, absolutely. With Temple coming in the next week when you, you just beat Maryland, just upset Maryland. So. Yeah, no box of chocolates there, that's no, for sure. No, as you, as you well know. Yeah. Uh, but Jeff Brom is a, you know, one of those hot commodities you hear about in the offseason. Jeff Brom, where's he going? He's, a, he's a, an innovative offensive mind. Yeah. Any complexities there that he offers? Yeah, I mean, he's a good football coach, you know. I mean, anytime you go up against these these uh, these guys, you know, I mean, they're they're, you know, you gotta you gotta be able to, you know, have a good game plan in there, and uh, you know, certainly uh, they've got a good program, and and uh, he's a fine football coach. Um, you can see how he attacks people in his scheme, and uh, I thought he's done a fabulous job. He's got, he runs a lot of special lead, he play, trick plays, a lot of fake puns. I mean, he's, all, he's got a lot of stuff going on, you know. And, uh, you know, we're just a, you know, team coming out here from Boston trying to match up with all that, you know. It's not easy. It, it is not, and also the fact that they're 0-3. I know you talked about it today. Da obviously a dangerous, winless team. We look at BC number 23 and number 25 and say, hey, that's awesome. They're in the top 25 for the first time in 10 years. You don't have to worry about your guys looking at that and maybe saying, hey, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm satisfied. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I think you do. Um, but all I can measure is we had a great practice today. I thought we had great effort. It didn't look like a team that was feeling good about themselves. You know, I mean, it's hard to feel too good about yourself in our program. We'll knock that right out of you. You know, so, I mean, probably to a fault. So, um, you know, one of our things this year has been this. I want to make sure we instill confidence in our team because they should have confidence. And I want to make sure our team has a little swagger because they should have a little swagger. And you're trying to find that balance of a team that, but it is a realistic team and understands how hard it is and what's at stake. I reminded them today at the beginning of practice to be, Frank with you. I pulled him up and I said, you know what? I said, uh, there's a lot of people that are saying a lot of nice things right now, but we've all been together when that wasn't the case. And if you drink that Kool-Aid, you're making a big mistake, okay? And all that we have to be concerned about is the people that are in that little circle we had today. That's what we needed to be concerned about right there because we had each other's back when this thing started and we're going to have to have each other's back as we fight through this deal. So, Go ahead and drink that Kool-Aid, and you'll see how fast that trip to the outhouse happens, okay? It's really quick. 
So I think that we have smart guys, and they understand that, and I think that they like football. I really don't feel that that is a potential problem right now, not to shut my eyes to it, because you're still dealing with human nature, and everybody, you know, I mean, Pete loves it when people tell him how good he looks and how handsome he is, and everybody likes to have smoke blown, and, you know, but you got to have the realization like Pete does to say, well, maybe I'm not that handsome. You know what I mean? And I look in the mirror at night and I say to myself, these guys are kind of full of crap. I kind of just an average looking guy, maybe got a little something special they don't know about. I don't know, right? So, yeah. But I'm with you. Little, 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 uh, we're just a bunch of, to me, we're a bunch of, you know, we're a bunch of guys that are trying to just <laughs> swing away and chip away at it. That's what we're doing. That's all we're doing on this football team. I mean, like you said, Right? I mean, they got really high thought of coaches that are really super smart. They've got really good players out there, and the Big Ten Conference is as good as it gets. Right. So, I mean, we're just going to go out there and do the best we can. That's the only, way, that's the only thing you can do. I, I'm still kind of thrown by who, who thinks Pete is good looking besides well, think, his wife. I think Steve might think I'm good looking because he we all I think the, I th we look a little alike. I gotta have a higher opinion of him. If he had a mustache, he'd look a little better. Uh, white mustache isn't gonna fly. I got a white mustache. It's all of mine. Is no, white. he told me he's got the, the white it. coming in. Oh, that's it. Get some Grecian. I got. I could go there. Big dark mustache. You and I would like you know yeah, we go back do. to the 70s. Don't worry if I had a chance. <laughs> Crony used to hang out at Studio 54 in the old days. That wouldn't make you a bad guy. No, no all good. <laughs> Not at all. All good. All right, coming up, we have a special guest at Jake and Joe's as the BC Football Show continues right here on the BC IMG Sports Network. Now the end zone. Don't even ask. Bow, bow. <laughs> Take a bow, Jeff Smith. You got six, 71 yards. Anthony Brown to Jeff Smith. Have they found the golden connection? This is the Boston College Football Show, presented by Bud Light. For more of tonight's show, let's go back to Jake and Joe's with your hosts, John Meter Perel. You know, no one can accuse Pete Cronin of ever jumping a call. I'll tell you that much. Well done. Take a bow, Pete. Nicely done. Part of the highlights filled game against Wake Forest. On Thursday night, as the Eagles improved to 3-0 and with a 41-34 win. This is the BC Football Show. Great to have you with us from Jake and Joe's. We're here every Monday night from 7 to 8. John Mita Perel with a very special guest. Good to see the new women's basketball coach, Joanna McNamee. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. And we're very excited about perhaps a renaissance period in BC women's basketball. I think a lot of fans <laughs> have been thirsting for a winner. No pressure, Coach. No pressure. But to rebuild this culture at BC, when you took the job after coming from Albany, what was your thought process? Initially, just super excited at the opportunity to coach at this level. You know, it's a dream for all coaches to have that opportunity to be in the ACC. The competition we're going to face is exciting. But for me, it's also that whole idea of rebuilding a program that I know once saw so much success. And I actually coached against them as an assistant coach. Back in the day, uh, I was at West Virginia University and at the University of Maryland. Uh, both, you know, we won national championship at Maryland. Uh, Boston College took us to overtime. Wow. You know, here. So I know that the success was uh, definitely a thing in this program, and maybe it fell off just a little bit, but that's what we're striving to get back to. And what do you have coming back in terms of, uh, I know there's not many grizzled veterans, but you're tr right. it's, it's a slow build, I know, and it's a, it's a cultural build, isn't it? It is, and I think the lucky thing, and it could be, I think, skewed one way or the other, I think it's lucky. We have seven freshmen, which is, I don't know of any school in the country right now that has seven true freshmen. I've never even heard of that. Neither have I. So we have five returners, uh, two of them are sophomores, three juniors, no seniors. So it's not a team that has a lot of experience, but it's a team that is ready and wide-eyed and looking for a new culture and excited about just anything that we do. So put in a new drill practice, everybody's fired up. Uh, give them a good speech, and everybody seems to relate and get excited. So they're very bought in right now, and they're happy to be at practices. And the grind, the seven freshmen, they didn't know what to expect anyways. 
So when we tell them how hard it's going to be, they yeah. believe us and then they want it, and they have been very uh, easy to coach. So hopefully that translates into some early wins. Well, that's a good clean slate. And if someone would ask you, I'm going to ask you right now, what's Joanna McNamee's philosophy? What's her formula for success? What do you pride yourself in as a coach? I'm kind of like a blue-collar person, so I pride myself on no matter what happens in every instance, we're going to work as hard as humanly possible and kind of have no excuses. So, and I know all coaches kind of say that, but I think that there is kind of a formula to that in the sense that when we practice every day, we make sure it's very high energy and positive, but with that positivity comes a lot of kind of an energy that is more a mindset. You know, so we want our players to have that feeling of confidence, but they're not really going to get it from their experiences just yet. So we try to put them in experiences every day and practice with competitions and things like that where they start to get, feel winning because winning is a habit. Sure. So everything that we're doing right now is trying to build their confidence, but also build their stamina because I want to be the most in shape team in the ACC. That's one of my goals. Uh, we play fast, uh, not rushed, but fast. So in order to play fast, every kid wants to play fast, but they don't really want to put in the work to get in the, in the shape that it takes. Yeah. So we're kind of getting on that grind to just play hard and have the mindset of, you know, nobody wants to come into Conti form and play us because we're going to put them through a track meet almost. And it's going to be a high energy style. That's good. And that, that creates not only from your standpoint, but I, I think it creates a fan, a fan base that likes that style of play. Right. That's college basketball to me. On the men's side and the women's side now, you play fast and you play long and you play uh, effective offensively and defensively. Coaches preach defense. What are you preaching on that end of the floor? Defense will play, you know, some man to man. But because we're a little bit undersized and we're young, you know, right now all we're working on is just the fundamentals of man-to-man -man defense, which is, of course, what I love. But I think that we'll be a, a team this year of changing defenses just to kind of throw teams off. And, and eventually, as I'm here a little bit longer and put more of my style in, I love to press and do things like that. But we're not quite ready for that. Probably this year you won't see a lot of that. But you will see us flipping from man to zone and hopefully put on – certain, you know, maybe a press for a few minutes a, a half or something like that, but it won't be too, too much. Can't be too much, especially with seven <laughs> right, freshmen. Right, it's definitely a young team. It, it's a process. It is. You can use that. Mm -hmm. It's a process. <laughs> it's yes. a process. It's a brick by brick build, for sure. It's been used before, and college basketball on the women's side, everybody thinks UConn right away. You look at a program like that, you've been around a while, not only as a head coach, but as an assistant. Gino Ariama to me is amazing. It's probably, it's probably the most amazing run in sports. Absolutely. Period. What he has done in terms of year in and year out success. How do they do it How, from what you've seen as, as an observer? Well, they, it starts with their recruiting. You know, they bring in the top players in the country, and if the top players in the country don't work out for him, he's got the next kid it's coming wave. in. Right. So it's a, it's a wave of players, but even with that, you still have to set your limits as a coach and what you're going to stand for. And I think that that's something that he does day in and day out. He he has this very high standard that he sets for his players. And those that don't meet it don't make it in this program. Yeah. And they know coming in what UConn basketball is all about. And it's funny, we talked to our players about what BC basketball is going to be all about. And that's that high standard. And having seven freshmen, that's kind of tough to get that get there. But we're working on it. You, you will get it done. We have full confidence that you will get it done. <laughs> and it all starts at home November 11th, a doubleheader with the men. Kicks yes. off officially November 8th, but then no November 11th, a doubleheader. So that's going to be a fun time to be at Chestnut Hill yes. that weekend. And, and Clemson is in the day before that to play BC in football. So right, that'll be exciting. We're talking some major seismic shifts on, on the BC <laughs> campus the weekend of November sure. 9th, 10th, and 11th. Coach, good luck. Thank Thanks you. for joining us here. and We hope to see you, you very me. soon. Great to have you. Thanks. Joanna McNamee, BC Women's Basketball Coach. On the BC Football Show, be sure to join the BC Gridiron Club. Support the Football Eagles. Benefits include home game, tailgates, away game, venue bashes, an unprecedented team and program access. Sign up today at bcfootballgridiron.com. They're always out at Jake and Joe's in full force. Paul Crescione and Don Terrian. 
You can also catch them on the road at Purdue on Saturday afternoon. We'll hear more from Coach Adazio after this. For- and BC leads. This is the Boston College Football Show, presented by Bud Light. For more of tonight's show, let's go back to Jake and Joe's with your hosts, Thanks, John Meter Perel. All right, great to be back at Jake and Joe's. We thank Joanna McNamee, the women's basketball coach at PC, for joining us. Steve Adazio back here at the table with Pete Cronin and Jami DePerel and Coach Tommy Sweeney, five catches the other night. Excellent touchdown, great touch on the throw by Anthony Brown. One thing we haven't mentioned is you guys had, what, three players of the week, including the Walter Camp Football Foundation Defensive Player of the Week and Wyatt Ray. I know honors don't mean much necessarily, but it's still you have to honor the player for doing that. Yeah. Four sacks, setting a BC record. Mike Mamula, Pete Cronin, were you on that list? Matthias Kiewin. They didn't Luka. have a list back then. <laughs> But I would have been honest. Honest. He always brings that up. They didn't w- keep stats. They didn't. <laughs> Kidding me? I kept my own stats. <laughs> I know you did. I, I, had a, I had a quarterback quarterback rating of 210. <laughs> <laughs> the one pass in your career, is that the right? The pass I ever threw, but yeah. perfect. <laughs> but the fact that Ray broke a BC record, we're talking a lot of good defensive ends in yeah. school history. Yeah, no, it's impressive. And uh, those guys got honored for their play uh, last week, which I think is is, is, is great to be recognized by the uh, na- by the nation and by the conference. So those are good things. When you have that going on, that probably means you might have had a chance to play pretty well as a team. So that's good. And you're going to need them in waves this week at Purdue as we bring you our keys to the game, brought to you by the all-new McGovern Chrysler Jeep Dodge Ram. Matt McGovern is the owner. They have a great selection of over 400 cars to choose from, 777 in Washington Street in Newton or at McGovernJeep.com. And Matt McGovern, a proud BC grad. All right, Coach, what do you have in the bag for Purdue? Well, I think, as I said earlier, on defense, I mean, I just think that we have to do a great job in disguising uh, our coverages and um, whether, you know, we're playing zone, we're playing man, we're coming after them, we're not. I think we need to do a great job there. I think on offense, we need to continue to be a, a very um, explosive offense, both run and pass. We've got to take care of the football. You know, I think that's important. And I think on special teams, uh, we've got to create great field position with special teams. And I'd really like to see a, a big explosive happen for us in special teams, whether it be a block punt or a kickoff return for a touchdown. So I think those are the things we need to do. Um, but I think we need to play with tremendous energy because um, we're going to take a, trying to get a road win on, in someone's back door on homecoming. So it's gonna, it won't be easy. No, Scott Mutrin interviewed you halftime and postgame last week, and I, I re- recall your comments postgame that when you're in there in that halftime, there was no finger pointing. You know, you, this was the first time that that football team had been stressed, and it, it was I think it was great representation of the senior leadership you have on yeah, this team. Yeah, it was. I mean, those kids were very confident. They were kind of like with us, like, Coach, we got this. You know, we we got this. You know, and, and, and they felt that way, and they were strong, and there was no wavering. There was never a moment where anybody was like, what's going on here? You know, that old what's going on routine. No, there's nothing going on, you know. We gave them, spotted them 14 points, and we're going to bring those 14 points back and surge ahead, and that was the mentality. And at halftime, it was all about the adjustments that had to be made and, you know, figuring out what was good, what was bad, and what we needed to do differently, and, and that was it. And they, 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 were, they were like wild men in that locker room. You know, there's a lot of energy in that locker room coming out uh, to start the uh, third period. So, you know, these are, these are, these are great kids. They're, they're passionate about the game. They're smart. Um, and I think, you know, they've got good chemistry. And, uh, and it's, it's fun to be around. And I, over the past several years, you've always talked about how this team is structured in terms of uh, senior leadership. And you always talk about it being, being built like a box, mm-hmm. you know, flat on the top, flat in the bottom, symmetrical. And when you got here, it was built more like a pyramid, you know, very, not a lot at the top, more at the bottom. This is that formula beginning to manifest itself, is it not? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that we've, we've been able to recruit and build our program. Like, that's where Joanna is now. She's trying to build her program. Um, and, and I think it, it's taken us, um, you know, this is my sixth season. And what happens is, you know, you start out early and you bring guys in, but you still have some cultural issues. And sometimes that can affect those guys coming in. And so it's a constant, you know, in bring it in and, and, and you're trying to, you know, 
grow it and develop it. It, ta it, it takes a while. And in, and in football, one of the deals is you're also in a foot race to get a quarterback. And if you have a couple there and you can develop them, that's great. But if you don't, you got to bring them in. Then you got to be right. And then when you're right, you got to develop them. And it's just time consuming. But um, but I'm telling you, what I, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I always say that because that's just what I believe. I know this. We've got we have recruited well. Um, how do you judge that? You don't judge it by how many stars they had when they came. You judge it by the fact that. We could potentially have somewhere between four and seven draft picks in the senior class. I guess that would tell you that's pretty good. Okay, and I think if we can keep doing that and keep building and keep bringing the right guys in here, and I, you know what I'm really most proud of, and I, this isn't about like I'm not trying to toot our horn. That's not where I'm coming at. I tell you, what I'm super, super proud of that we have brought in talented players, but they re they are BC men, and they represent Boston College. In the, and, and if you're a fan or an alumnus and you can't love on this football team and appreciate that they represent the very best of Boston College, you are you have missed the boat completely, okay? So we brought the right kids in here and developed them, you know? And, and I'm going to tell you what, they're student athletes now. In, in an era where that word is used very loosely, not here. And so, um, you know, you want, you want them, they, they, these guys are like your sons and uh, and I've been coaching in a lot of leagues in a lot of years. I've never seen it like this before. So this is a tremendous group of guys that, you know, you love them. Every, you just look at them and you just love them, you know, and you're proud of them. And, and what does that mean? Does that buy you a win? I don't, know what, I don't know what it means sometimes, right? Everything's got to align the right way. But you can rest assured that there's some talent here and there's some character here, and, 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 and they're going to do the right thing. No, a lot of coaches can't say that. That was well said. I think Pete and I talk about it every week in terms of the total immersive BC experience. Yeah, I got a few of them in my class right now. I can tell you they're studying hard. So that's a good thing. I thought you were an I easy. An I, I thought you'd yeah. be an easy mark. I not know, not so much anymore. Huh? I told these guys. I you know what you got to watch out for? Like they're smarter than me. Oh. What if they're smarter than you and you're the teacher? Guilty as charged. What if? <laughs> What if? What if? Well, you quite, yeah, don't question it. <laughs> what? Lindstrom's in the class. He's, a, he's answering left and right. I'm like, God, yeah, love him. I could never get in here. I couldn't survive. No oh, chance. Oh, you kidding me? Ithaca? Neither could I. I did get in, but they wouldn't let me in now. <laughs> <laughs> Much harder than it ever has been. Coach, that was an outstanding show. We appreciate the insight as always. Good luck at Purdue. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, go Eagles. Go Eagles, absolutely. We'll all start at 1130 on the BC IMG Sports Network. Noon, the kickoff time. Special thanks to Steve Chach, Chachio, Jason Baum, everybody here at Jake and Joe's, Barry Gallup, Reggie Terry, of course, Paul Crescioni, and Don Terrian. We'll catch you again on Saturday at 1130. For Pete Cronin, I'm Johnny DePorel. Have a great night, everybody.